Okay, so, um, and actually talking of the chat, I wanted to just get a sense of who is here and uh, to find out a bit, uh, just to know a bit more about your background in this field and it, it specifically in relation to corpora. Um, so, you know, I wondered if anybody here has, uh, you know, used a corpus or maybe somebody has designed or created a corpus. Uh, maybe you have um, worked with corpus data or read articles that use corpus data. Um, or maybe you're, you're not quite sure what a corpus is. Um, so we could be anywhere along that range. So could you just, in the chat, can you just put a, a verb to indicate your kind of maximum um, familiarity with corpora. So if you've if you've created a corpus, then you could put created. Or if you have used a corpus or referred to a corpus, you could just write used or referred to. Um, or if you've very little idea about any about corpora at all, you could just put a question mark. So if everybody could just uh, give me some idea that. Okay, so several people have created a corpus, and right, including a video corpus, and uh, most other people have used a corpus, um, maybe for for research, uh, or maybe also somebody mentioned uh, teaching materials using corpus-based teaching materials. Um, so, okay, so. What I'm going to do, so I'm going to be talking about designing and using a bilingual writer corpus. So um, I'm going to, uh, actually, pardon me, let me run the PowerPoint. There we go. Um, I hope you can see the PowerPoint and me now. Um, so I'm going to just briefly go over some background. First, first of all, about corpora and what is a language corpus and, and different types of corpora. Um, and then the other kind of issue, which I'm connecting to that, which is multilingualism um, and the uh, multilingual turn in applied linguistics and how that has uh, kind of fed into uh, research in general and especially how it's related to corpora. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about our, uh, the, the corpus which we've been creating, which is called the Zayed Arabic English Bilingual Undergraduate Corpus. Zaybook. Um, and then the rest of the time I'll tell you more about that. So how did we collect the data, um, how it's been analysed and annotated, uh, research questions which are being addressed with the corpus or can be, and uh, developments for the corpus. So, um, Okay, right, now I'm seeing, pardon me. Okay, I'm not seeing actually the somehow the full projected slide, but I'm seeing the slide anyway, and hopefully you'll see the same slide as I am. Let me know if, uh, if there's any disconnect between what I'm saying and what I'm seeing. So, um, uh, okay, so first of all, what is a language corpus? So. Um, so a basic answer, which I've put here, is a collection of digitized texts for research. All good. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, okay, a collection of digitized texts for research. So, um, uh, of course, in the past, a corpus... The term corpus was used for a collection of, of, of texts, not necessarily digitized. Um, but in the kind of modern sense of the word, it's they, they are digital texts or digitized from some other kind of format um, and used for research. Um, so broadly with the advantage that they can, um, that it's a, a large collection which provides a lot of examples of language use, which can be searched through and, uh, and analyzed on a large scale, often quantitatively. So um, different kinds of corpora. So um, the, the first corpora really were written 
genre corpora. Um, so written in the sense that their, their written texts were used. So it was a collection of uh, digital written texts. Um, and genre corpora, I call them genre corpora because they're usually focusing on some kind of genre or a set of genres, um, such as um, newspaper articles or um, academic textbooks or, um, you know, uh, emails nowadays, things like that. So often a corpus is, is one genre or it's a, a particular set of genre, genres. So um, in uh, written corpora, for example, so I'll put some examples here, British Academic Written English Corpus, which you might be familiar with, B-A-W-E, um, which has been used for various, um, uh, many research projects, as well as uh, curriculum development and other purposes. Um, another example of a genre corpus, uh, a very focused one, is the Quranic Arabic corpus. Um, so I haven't put uh, references for these, but if you Google the, the name of the corpus, you'll be able to find these corpora. Um, so the Quranic Arabic corpus is basically the Quran, um, but uh, presented online and annotated with um, a lot of layers of analysis, including parts of speech, um, syntactic dependencies, and um, uh, also entity, um, particular entities or people or events referred to in the Quran are um, kind of indexed and, and brought out so that it can be searched for various purposes. Um, one that I noticed is, I believe, hosted at Macquarie is Australian Corpus of English. Um, so that's focusing on Australian English in different genres, but the, the overall focus of the corpus is that it's Australian English. Um, and the International Corpus of English, which is a, um, a collection of writing from different countries. So mostly countries where English is a first language or a kind of official second language. So these are all written genre and there's many of those. Um, then the um, another category kind of development from that is smoke, spoken genre corpora. So similar but using spoken genre. So um, for example there's the Australian Radio Talkback Corpus which is um, from, uh, from radio programs and kind of dialogic radio programs, as far as I understand. So um, uh, conversation on radio and uh, uh, not just one person talking in a scripted way, but um, interactive radio. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a corpus called the Arabic Speech Corpus, which is, um, I think prepared for um, kind of speech analysis purposes and so it's a very very kind of focused one with short utterances uh, which are recorded in audio files. So spoken corpora often are available in audio format and transcribed format. Um, and then there's other ones like the, the, the Berlin Map Task Corpus um, is a corpus of school children in Germany um, doing a pair map task where one of them is describing um, something on a map and the other student is drawing on a map um, what the, the first student is describing. Um, and it's interesting because it, um, it's, a, it's a multimodal corpus, so it includes, the actual corpus includes not only um, a transcription of what the students say, um, and an audio recording of what they say, but also a video of the, um, the hand drawing the map. So it doesn't actually show their faces, um, but it shows um, the, the, the map drawing hand, which, and so all those sets of data relate to each other, obviously. Um, then, okay, then we have something which is called parallel corpora, which is, um, I've said here, for example, for translation studies. So the, um, I've put in brackets uh, one purpose which can, these corpora can be used for. Um, so a parallel, parallel corpora um, include, a parallel corpus includes texts in one language and then the translations of those texts in another language. 
So um, we have, for example, the English German translation corpus, which is a lot of texts in English and their translations in Arabic, in uh, pardon me, German. Um, which uh, and they, I think those are mostly fiction texts, um, books which have been translated. Um, so, so parallel corpora also have a genre focus. Um, just like the other corpora do. Um, there's the multi-dialectal parallel corpus of Arabic, which was created by, in fact, uh, Nizar Habash, who is my uh, collaborator on this project, um, which is, um, it's not different languages, but it's different dialects of Arabic, which are very different. Like the dialects of Arabic are as different from each other as, uh, for example, Norwegian and Danish and Swedish are, I think. Um, so, uh, and that was that's actually a set of sentences which are then which were then translated into different dialects by people from different regions um, and the purpose of this is i mean for translation studies i've said i mean to study the process of translation um, but especially in natural language processing um, it has been a uh, um, it has been a um, uh, a boon in that case. So you get very large corpora, such as the, the digital corpus of the European Parliament is, in principle, all the publicly available um, official documents of the European Parliament in their translations. Look, there are 21, is it 21 languages in the EU. Um, so many, many translations of each one, um, all set up and aligned. So the idea is you can search for um a uh, sentence in one text and then you can see the translation of that sentence in another i think the digital corpus of the european parliament has not actually reached that stage yet so often one document is aligned with another document some languages are missing things like that but but the principle is is that um so parallel corpora and then uh okay and then we have Okay, right, yes. So, um, and then we have learner corpora, what are called learner corpora. Now, learner here usually means language learner. So um, this is typically a collection of um, writing or speaking by um, people who are deemed to be um, language learners. So for example, language students at various levels. Um, so examples of these are, on the right, we've got the Cambridge Learner Corpus, which is taken from um, candidates taking Cambridge exams, like the first certificate and uh, the uh, uh, PET, I guess, and proficiency exams. Um, so, uh, so that's a very large collection of essays by students from many different countries, which uh, they've collected from those exams. Um, then the so and like a lot of these corpora, they're mostly in English. English is the most kind of popular language to have corpora in, um, but they also exist in other languages. So I've taken an Arabic example. There's an Arabic learner corpus, um, which is a sample of writing from students who are studying Arabic as a foreign language in Saudi Arabia. Um, and this is again organized and set up um, and divided by level, the level of the student, for example. Um, there is, for example, the University of Sao Paulo um, multilingual learner corpus. Now, um, with the other corpora, for example, the Cambridge learner corpus and the Arabic learner corpus, um, it's all in one language, but the learners are from different backgrounds. So you have learners of English or learners of Arabic who are coming from, um, you know, different countries, different uh, first languages. Um, th but the idea of the, the USP multilingual learner corpus is that these are all Brazilian learners. So presumably their first language is Portuguese, um, but they are learning different languages. And so there are texts in English, texts in German, texts in Spanish, but the unifying idea is that the, uh, the, the students have a Portuguese language background, Brazilian. 
Um, and there is even developing at uh, the University of Louvain in Belgium, which is a big center for learner corpora research in general. Um, they have a multilingual student translation corpus, which is, um, so in this case, this is learners of translation. So translation students and their, um, their work in translation, attempts at translation, um, are put into a, a, a parallel corpus but it's a bit different from the parallel corpus that uh, that I was describing just now, which is assumed to be done by expert translators. So this is student translators um, with the original text and the translation in that uh, multilingual student translation corpus. Now, the what do people do with these corpora? Um, so on the left, you can see here, I've said, so one of the first things that people looked at in these corpora was errors. So error analysis was a, um, uh, you know, one of the first ways of looking at learner language in a principled way. Um, and so learner corpora are often marked up for, um, for errors. So in, in all of these corpora, you will have the, the actual language data, and then you'll have some markup on it, some annotation or metadata, um, which uh, kind of analyzes the data in some way. So in a learner corpus, you will have, um, for example, somebody will go through and mark all the errors and perhaps mark what type of error um, there is. And so then people will be able to search the corpus for, not for a particular word, but for a particular type of error, which can be very useful. Um, now, the doing this error analysis and, and error annotation in a, in a corpus um, makes you think about whether you really know what is the learner trying to say. So whenever you correct an error, you have what's called the target hypothesis. So you have, you have in your mind some idea, oh, this learner is trying to say this. For example, they're trying to say, I went, but they wrote, I go. Okay, now I go, of course, is not incorrect, uh, but in the context, you, you see that they meant I went, um, and so that's flagged as an error. Um, and so you have this hypothesis that the learner was trying to write, I went. Okay, so that's the target hypothesis. And sometimes there are competing target hypotheses. So, uh, you know, it's not clear, different annotators might have different ideas about what the learner was trying to say or write. So that has become um, a, a focus of discussion and some corpora have in fact alternative corrections added to the corpus um, in cases where annotators have disagreed. Um, so errors is one important area. Later, um, people started looking at not only errors, but just differences between learner language and, quote, native speaker language. So um, this involves comparing, for example, um, uh, you know, frequency of use of forms like will and going to for the future, which are both might be both correct. But when you compare learner language with uh, a reference corpus of native speaker use, however that's defined, um, there will be differences. So, so maybe the learners would use um, will more than the native speakers would. Okay, so, um, so from a focus on errors to a focus on differences, and this requires some kind of reference corpus which you compare the learner language with. Um, and this has kind of learner corpus data has not always been um, sort of part of the mainstream of SLA, second language acquisition research. So there's a lot of second language acquisition research which involves, for example, um, you know, learner judgments about particular specific sentences, um, experiments, um, maybe observation of particular individuals. Um, consideration of the context a lot, um, and corpus data has um, has not always been well integrated with that. Although recently, that they're, they're kind of coming together. 
Um, but one thing in which has kind of united them is um, usage-based theories of language acquisition, um, which are kind of linked to uh, machine learning models and what people have learned about how um, how computers detect regularities in um, in large amounts of text and how uh, computers can learn to understand language, interpret language. Um, so usage based uh emergentist models of language acquisition are focusing more less on kind of yet language universals and underlying rules but more on the um the input basically which a learner has uh, including for first language acquisition and for second language acquisition as well um okay so that's corpora now um we will let's have a look now at the multilingual turn which is um has for example i mean in 2013 may was writing there was a book he edited a book called the multilingual turn so the this is the idea that um multilingualism rather than monolingualism um is the new norm of applied linguistic and sociolinguistic analysis so more consideration um although in the past linguistics and applied linguistics was um you know there was a focus on i guess exotic languages at a certain period in the past um but then later a lot of the research on language was talking about english especially um and even if not english then just one language at a time um whereas there's been more recognition recently that multilingualism is is not a kind of um uh, outlier or unusual thing it's a um it's something which is very widespread um and it's estimated that it's estimated that more than half of the people in the world use more than one language every day um so so multilingualism is not a um not a minority pursuit, as it were um, so that in the world there's 6,000 plus languages in less than 2,000, 200 countries. So there's a lot of countries have more than one language in them, especially nowadays with migration and um, greater migration and contact um, between countries, um, between languages. Um, and so this all leads to the idea of looking at languages in the context of other languages. So multilingual societies. So countries or societies where more than one language is in contact or is used together with another um, and also individuals which you know often the same word is used multilingual individuals um, or bilingual individuals um, in the eu they have this concept of plurilingualism which is used to talk about um, in about two languages being used together in one person, okay, which is different from um, them being used together in one country. So, um, so this has led to. Um, so we're not talking about corpora at the moment, but um, the use of smaller data sets um, to compare. Um, well. Okay, so if we look at this example here, this is from this is before its time, really. This study is a good example from 2004 by Neff et al. Um, so their data set was this: it was um, they had some expert writing in English and in Spanish, um, L1. So these are native professional authors. Uh, there were 15 published editorial articles in L1 English by professional authors, and 15 published editorial articles in L1 Spanish by professional authors. So those are kind of reference corpora for these, which are, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but uh, the next two lines, um, uh, 30 essays in L2 English by fourth year EFL students whose L1 is Spanish. Okay, so that's like a learner corpus, uh, but a, a tiny one, you know, 30 essays. Um, but then also they collected 30 essays in Spanish by the same students. So the idea was to compare 
um, the same person's writing in two languages, in their first language and in their second language. Um, and this is quite a departure because um, the study of learner corpora, for example, in English, often preceded by comparing learner language with native language. Uh, so comparing um, learner English with native English, or sometimes comparing, um, for example, Chinese learner English with Spanish learner English. So it was all very much focused on one language, on the English, and the uh, uh, the, the the writers' um, first language was almost a kind of background variable. Um, it wasn't looked at in itself. But in this study, Neff et al, they, they actually took samples of their English writing and their Spanish writing from the same students. And they also, interestingly, got, did the same with some first year students. So the idea here was to compare less experienced with more experienced writers. And bear in mind that these students would be becoming more experienced in writing at university, not only in English, but also in their first language, they would be gaining experience in, in writing. Um, and so Nef et al made a very interesting set of comparisons between um, comparing the students' English with the professional expert writers' English, um, comparing their, the students' English with some American university students. Okay. Um, and comparing it with their uh, with another cohort of students who had reached the, the the so the first year and the fourth year students in terms of degree of experience of writing. Okay, so um, so so one of the interesting things about this is that they're looking at um, uh, the first language at all and involving it in these studies. Um, another interesting thing is that they're looking they're considering that not everybody is at the same level or has the same kind of usage of language in the, even in their first language. So if you talk about the native speaker, um, that's an abstraction. Um, so, you know, my English is different from your English and, um, you know, it's not necessarily a, a, a question of development or that one is better than the other, but um, individual variation is an important uh, thing to take into account. So, um, so this was an early study which used a very interesting data set and, and made very interesting comparisons between these sets of data, um, but it's, it's not a corpus, okay, it's, I mean, it, or it's a very small corpus, it's um, just 15 articles, 30 essays here. Um, now, there have been a series of studies kind of related to that, um, using the model of multi-competence, which is um, kind of thing, so based on the idea of language competence in the Chomskyan sense of individual abstracted knowledge about um, how a language works, um, and looking at bilingual individuals not as having two separate um, languages, two separate competences, um, but having, you know, one brain with one competence, which um, draws on maybe two different language systems, but um, uses them together. So um, looking more at bilingual writers, multilingual writers, um, and there are a number of studies of these. I'll, I'll, I've taken a couple of examples here. So Rina et al. Rinat and Kobayashi have done a whole series of studies on writers of Japanese and English, um, and sometimes Chinese also, so sometimes trilingual learners. Um, so for example, in this study in 2015, they looked at L1 English and L2 Japanese argumentation essays by the same Japanese as a foreign language writers. Okay. So these are people from maybe different countries who are learning Japanese. Um, or, um, sorry, pardon me, L1 is English. So yeah, so they're um, L1 English. Um, so the same L1 and they're the same L2, they're learning Japanese. Um, 
and they also had writers' reflections on the writing process. Uh, and they were interested in how writers maybe transferred strategies from writing an argumentative essay in one language to writing in another. Um, or maybe not necessarily transfer so much as getting some kind of underlying proficiency in writing an argumentative essay, which could be applied in different languages. Um, and of course, people improve in this in their first language as well as in their second language. Um, and then these were, they also had a set of L1 Japanese essays by Japanese university students to compare it with. This is the kind of native speaker uh, reference data part of it. Um, again, it's a uh, fairly small number, so 19, um, 19 uh, Japanese or foreign language writers and 21 um, Japanese university students. Um, and then another, another study um, that I did with Suha Karaki a few years back was to look at um, a set of essays in English and Arabic um, from a set of 40 students um, at two points in a semester. Um, again, it's a fairly small data set, um, and it was even smaller because there were gaps, like some students didn't turn up for one of them, or, um, you know, we had some students, we didn't have both languages from them. Some students, we didn't have uh, both beginning and end of the semester from. Um, so we were able to make some comparisons with, with the, the data set that we had, um, but because of logistics, there were gaps in there, as I know there were also in, in uh, Rinat's study, for example. Um, so that's another kind of study with kind of small data sets of bilingual, multilingual writers um, looking at their linguistic repertoire. Now, when I started thinking about making a, a larger corpus, so not this um, smaller data set, but a, a larger corpus of multilingual writing. Um, and I kind of looked around for multilingual corpora, and um, you'll find that there, are, there is a variety of things which are referred to as multilingual corpora now, in the last sort of decade. Um, so Schmidt and Werner published a book about multilingual corpora in 2012, and they use the term very broadly to mean any systematic collection of empirical language data, enabling linguists to carry out analyses of multilingual individuals, multilingual societies, or multilingual communication. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't actually mention texts, for example. You know, these corpora could be single sentences, um, taken from texts or from some sort of set up situation. Um, so they include in that book, they talk about uh, learner corpora, which we've mentioned, attrition corpora, so from um, uh, language attrition situations where people are, people's use of a language is kind of disappearing or deteriorating or becoming simplified. Um, language contact corpora, where in situations where two languages are regularly in contact together and maybe there's some influence between them. Um, interpreting corpora, which are kind of related to uh, uh, parallel corpora, as we mentioned, so corpora of people doing interpreting uh, between languages. Um, and comparable and parallel corpora. So, so we mentioned parallel corpora are. Um, basically translations, a text and its translation, uh, aligned in some way. Um, comparable corpora are, um, again, you have texts in one language and texts in another language, but they're not the same text translated. They are, for example, um, French newspaper articles and English newspaper articles from a similar, like, newspapers which are considered a similar kind of newspaper. So that's what's meant by comparable corpora in that case. So they're comparable in genre, comparable in the situation of their production, um, the texts, but in different languages. 
And um, so going on from that, in it's only in the last uh, few years, really, that there have been um, matched, large matched samples of bilingual writing. So, um, so last year there were two papers published. Um, one, uh, Strobel et al. is looking at um, not such a large set of learners. I mean, it's 160, um, sorry, samples, 160 texts. This is actually 80 university students um, who chose um, a, a German essay assignment, which they'd written at university, and an English assignment. And um, so the, the, the data set which is used in that study is um, 160 texts, half of them in German, half of them in English, and they are matched by writer. Okay, so we know that this text in German was written by the same student as this text in English. And that's a very important uh, development. Um, there, there's, there are uh, some of the studies, as I mentioned in the, the previous stage, like Rinat et al. There are also studies which look at larger samples of writing in two languages, but we don't know which student wrote which essay, so they're not matched. Um, but uh, this Strubel et al. paper is very interesting because it looks at, it, it's 80 texts and they're long texts, so the mean text length is 5,000 words. Um, so they're able to um, make statistical inferences about a particular issue that they are looking at in relation to this corpus, which is about um, complexity types of um, especially syntactic complexity, um, and whether there's a correlation between uh, the complexity of students writing in German and in their writing in English, the same students writing in English. Um, and they relate this to a, uh, as I mentioned a little bit before, an emergentist perspective, um, usage-based perspective on language acquisition, um, which focuses very much on um, individual variation and how that, how language proficiency is always changing and always developing, even in your first language. Okay, so that's an important um, issue which they, which they link to this, uh, to this kind of data set. Um, and then the other, the only other case I've found is, um, is a very interesting corpus by Meunier et al, at, I believe at Louvain, again in Belgium, um, which is emails written by 438 French L1 learners of Dutch um, and English. Okay, so there are three languages involved. Um, so the, the students, uh, I think they're in kind of, they're aged around maybe 13, 14, 15. Um, they wrote emails, so their first language is French, uh, but they wrote email, they're learning Dutch and they're learning English. And so they have texts from each learner in the three languages. And they also have a reference corpus of uh, writing by native Dutch speakers and also Americans, native, presumed to be native English speakers. Um, their corpus also involves two time points, so they collected data, I think, a year apart, maybe a bit longer, um, and rich metadata. So they have a lot of information. So metadata here in a corpus is, means contextualizing information that we know about, um, about the writer, about the texts. So in this case, Muni et al.'s case, they have a lot of information about, for example, um, some of these children are in a CLIL environment, a content and language integrated learning environment. Others are in a more traditional uh, language teaching educational environment. Um, they know the age, they know some of their school scores also for these learners. So um, it's good to, uh, so that, that's a great, uh, Corpus, which is sort of up and coming, and uh, in this in this field. So, um, 
coming back to this question of what is a language corpus, um, to, to put it more precisely, so the way I've defined language corpus is a large principled collection of authentic representative texts with supporting metadata, which can be used for various kinds of research. So um, the, okay, uh, I'm gonna have to admit that I'm, I'm seeing my kind of, um, I'm seeing the full slide with all the points on. Are you seeing um, a blank slide that needs some animations to produce text? Do you see? Do you see two columns of text on the uh, on the PowerPoint slide? Two columns of text. Excellent. Okay, so you're seeing the same as me. Um, so um, on the left, um, I've just kind of explained briefly these bolded terms. So when I say a large collection of texts, how large is large? Um, well. The idea is that it's large enough to support statistical inference um, about even less frequent linguistic features. So not only very common linguistic features like articles, um, but also ideally less frequent ones like um, you know particular adverbs or particular uh, constructions. Um, now again, this is not it's not fixed. You know how. What, what's, what's a less frequent linguistic feature. Um, but the idea is that, it, um, that the size of the corpus is important for that reason. So that um, A, it will show up examples of things which are not so frequent in language, if you have a larger sample. Um, and also that it will be easier to make statistical inferences from what you find in that corpus. Um, a large principal collection, so a corpus is always selected according to some, usually collected some sort of theoretically motivated principle about what kind of data is important. Um, so, um, so let me take these in conjunction with the points on the right, which are about uh, Zaybook, about our corpus. So um, our corpus includes 600 about 600 short essays written by 422 incoming students. So they had really just graduated from high school and this was one of the first things that they did in the university. Um, and it's, so it adds up to about 90,000 words of English text, about 34,000 words of Arabic. Now, uh, one reason why the Arabic is less than the English is because of logistical uh, difficulties. So it turned out that a lot of the uh, Arabic students, so we, we collected this online, I'll talk about this in a minute, but, um, but it, we collected this writing online um, in class, but it turned out that a lot of the Arabic students, well, a lot of the students writing in Arabic, their teacher um, got them to write it by hand. So, um, so, and we were able to get hold of some of those handwritten texts and transcribe them, um, but it, it reduced that part of the corpus. Um, now, the other reason why the number of uh, words is less in Arabic is because, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Arabic, but um, some words are joined together, they're written together. So, for example, articles, prepositions, uh, pronouns, which in English would be a separate word, in Arabic, are, uh, they're also like, linguistically, they could be considered a separate word, but they are clitic um, or they're written, um, they're attached to the word phonologically, or they are also written together in writing. And so, um, uh, so it appears as though there are less words. There's not necessarily less ideas there, fewer ideas, but um, the, the word count uh, in the raw writing is, um, is different. Okay, so um, so that's the large enough part. So the selected, so I said selected according to some theoretically motivated principles. So in our case, um, we wanted to focus on individual writers, not, not necessarily only one individual, but we wanted to know um, 
this writer produced this Arabic text and this English text. So we wanted to be we we wanted to look at individual variation, um, it, variation at an individual level um, across languages. And so it needed to be matched in this uh, in, in this way, and we were interested in their initially in their written repertoire. Um, okay, so we've, so a language corpus is a large principal collection of authentic representative texts. Now, so by authentic here, um, I'm meaning more or less uh, Greece 2013 talks about naturalness of data in second language acquisition research um, <clears throat> as on a kind of decline from um, experimental situations where um, the language produced is in response to a specific stimulus and in a maybe an artificial situation to um, something like I'm doing now, a uh, kind of natural situation where I'm uh, I'm expressing uh, my ideas and constructing my own uh, discourse. <coughs> so uh, there's a whole scale of these, um, and Greece emphasizes that this is really a subjective matter, so that so two people might be in the same situation, and one of them might see it as a, a fairly natural way to communicate, and another person might find it an artificial situation. Um, so in the case of our writings, this is students writing an essay in class because they've been asked to by their teacher, um, which is, you know, it's not the most authentic situation, but it is it is a situation that the students find themselves in regularly, and that I think they're used to it, and they they uh, they have an idea about how to respond in that situation. Um, and it was actually presented not as a graded piece of work, but as a, it was a diagnostic assessment, which the students took at the beginning of their English writing course and at the beginning of their Arabic writing course, both of which are courses that they take in their first semester. Um, and so it's the situation was controlled um, in that the students they were doing it online in a lockdown browser, meaning that they couldn't consult um, uh, dictionaries or um, spell checkers, for example. Um, so it, so that made it a bit artificial in in one way. A lot of the writing they're doing is not going to be uh, done in that situation, but. Um, and comparable in the sense that we use the same kind of setup and the same topics for the English writing task and the Arabic writing task. Um, okay, then now representative. So the idea is that a corpus is not a random, you know, it, I mean, it's not theoretically random, but it's also um, not random in the sense that it's, um, it's supposed to be representative language of something, of some discourse community. So it could be of, for example, Australia as a discourse community in the Australian uh, contemporary English corpus. Um, or it could be, um, you know, the academic discourse community. So it's representative of some kind of writing, um, some or some kind of speaking, some kind of language use in a particular domain. So in our case, um, we were interested in so the UAE context, um, national university students. So this means um, so we're in the UAE, the United Arab Emirates. Um, our students are almost all um, what we call local students, Emirati students. So they are nationals of the country. Now that's that might be taken for granted in a lot of places, but in the UAE. Um, they form actually only 10% of the population. So 90% of the population here is um, foreign workers, people like me. Um, so people from various, many countries um, who work in various fields. Um, uh, but we were focusing on this particular fairly homogenous population of uh, UAE National University students. Um, and they're in an expanding, you might have heard the phrase expanding circle, outer circle. Um, so in the sense that the UAE, in relation to English, the UAE is not what you might call an Anglophone country. 
but there is a lot of English in the UAE, and it's used as a lingua franca in hospitals, in shops, in restaurants. Uh, it's the language, the medium of instruction at most universities here, um, and a lot of secondary schools also. So that that's so. This is the kind of context from which we're trying to draw a representative sample of writing. So the, the university context in this kind of society. Um, okay, with metadata to contextualize the language. So we added, we've added some metadata, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and uh, the idea is that the corpus is sustainable and adaptable. So, so we used kind of standard ways to uh, construct the corpus and analyze the corpus. And we're intending to make it an open resource for research and also open-ended. So we're going to develop the corpus, as I'll tell you about shortly. Um, okay, so, so basically, I'll, I'll rush through this a bit. But uh, so, as I've said, in August, September 2019, um, we um, gave this writing prompt to students once in their Arabic course and once in their English course, so on different occasions. Um, and it was to write 200 words showing your opinions and knowledge about one of the topics. And they were given three topics. One was tolerance. Um, one was, uh, it was a bit of a longer prompt, but uh, how can we promote a culture of tolerance in the UAE? Um, what are some recent developments in the UAE? This is the second topic. And then the most popular topic that students chose was social media. Uh, which was what are the effects of social media on in the individual and society, on individuals and society. Um, so I, I've explained the logistics, so that's great. And then students also filled in a consent form um, and answered a couple of demographic questions to gather data about the student. So um, this is the kind of writing sample that you get in the uh, in the corpus. So this is two pieces of writing that I took at random, um, pretty much from one student. So you see there's a writer ID at the top, seven nine seven two three six, and the Arabic uh, one is the same writer, 97236. So this student wrote this in English and this on a separate occasion in Arabic, and we have these in the corpus. And uh, so she starts off I say she because most of our students are female, uh, which is which is not uncommon elsewhere in the world, I think, but um, but it's on a much greater scale here. Something like eighty percent of students are female. Um, so she wrote, um, "Nowadays, phones is plays a great role in our life. It's a hot potato." So that's the beginning of her essay in English, and then this is her essay in Arabic, and. Um, those of you who can read Arabic might notice that, for example, at her title in Arabic, she's written al social media. She's written social, the English phrase social media, but just written in, in Arabic script. Um, and in her first sentence, she talks, she, she refers here to al tawasal al ijtimai, which is the Arabic for social media, or al social media. So she, she uses the Arabic, she does know the Arabic phrase. But then she feels that it's necessary to um, to use the English phrase, but written in Arabic script. Um, note that this is not a, what exactly what she wrote in either, um, because this is the corrected version. I'll tell you about this in a second. Um, so, in order to be able to search for, um, okay, yep. 4 p.m. out of time. Um, so, uh, what should I do, Joe? You're the or Ingrid? Um, I think it's fine if you keep going for a little while. If people need to leave, they can leave. But uh, either that or, I mean, we can we can let it run. It's okay. You know, but I'll try not to keep going too long. Then. Yeah, if you especially if you want questions, you know. That's, right. Yeah. Okay. All right, sure. So, um, yeah, so that's just to show you a kind of sample of the kind of writing. Um, but 
uh, yeah, so the, so the reason why we had to correct errors was because if you're going to be searching a corpus um, for particular words, um, and those words are spelt in different ways um, because of mistakes in spelling, <coughs> then, um, then you're not going to be able to, to find the words. So, um, but on the other hand, you know, we are interested also, some people are interested in those spelling mistakes. So we need to have different versions of the corpus, different layers, um, which are kind of linked with each other. Oh, right. Thanks, Denise. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, yes, so let's have a look at what happened to the data once the students did this writing. So, so we collected these uh, digital texts from the students. And then we had to go through the, we went through these stages. So the first was formatting, tidying up. Um, for example, students put, um, they put a title at the top of their essay and they put lots of spaces or when they put a new paragraph, they put lots of spaces to indent it, things like this. So it was reformatted just to kind of make them all in the same format. And then, Okay, right. So I will, uh, yeah, so I'll just go through in a couple of minutes and uh, then we'll get on to questions. Um, so, uh, so formatting, sometimes transcribing, as I say, some students wrote their essay by hand and we were able to get a copy of that. And so they were transcribed. Uh, we added met metadata about the writer. I'll come back. You'll see in a minute what kind of metadata there is. Um, CEFR assessment. So this is the Common European Framework of Reference for Assessment, which is a framework for assessing um, language proficiency. Um, and so we had some assessors who were competent in English and Arabic look at their writing in English and their writing in Arabic and uh, place the right, that piece of writing in a band in the CEFR system. Um, then correction. First of spelling, so we have a spell corrected version, and then of basic grammar, so we have a um, things like missing words or no subject in sentences, things like that were corrected in another version. So that gave us three versions of the corpus and a CEFR assessment. Um, then tokenization, which means separating words, which in English is not not a big deal. Um, just some word, for example, don't has do not would be separated into do not. Uh, but in Arabic, it's much more important because of the thing I mentioned about words being written together. The corpus is tagged for parts of speech. Um, and we used for, well, we've tried different systems, but we're using in the final version, we're using um, a part of speech system called the um, universal dependencies, which is specifically designed to be applicable across languages because um, parts of speech in their detail are not necessarily the same in one language as in another. In English and Arabic, for example, are very diff different. Lemmatization, so um, the lemma, the kind of word family. Um, so each word in the corpus is assigned um, to a word family. So we can see that go and goes, for example, are the same word, in a sense, the same lemma. And then manual checking of all this. So tokenization, parts of speech lemmatization is done automatically by software, and then that needs to be checked manually. Um, okay, I will skip over those. These are kind of examples of how of searches in the corpus. Um, uh, so, and I will finish really with this, which is some sample request, research questions which people are looking at in relation to the Zaybook course. So, um, how if some of them are about methodology, for example, how effective is the common European framework of reference as an assessment instrument for for Arabic is one thing, and for L1 writing is another, because the CEFR was really designed for people who were speaking using a second language or a third language, um, a foreign language. Um, so, but we've accepted that there is individual variation in people's first language also. And so how suitable is CFR as, a, uh, as an assessment instrument for L1? Um, secondly, 
for example, nominalizations. Do students who use more nominalizations in their Arabic writing also tend to use more nominalizations in their English writing? Is there a correlation between those? Um, this one is about semantics, word semantics. So what differences and similarities between Arabic and English are there in the word semantics of individual students' texts on the same topic? So um, this involves semantic tagging, which is being done by one of the researchers. So adding to each word a semantic tag, a bit like in a thesaurus, the way you have the meaning of a word kind of put in a category. It's related to emotion or to, to uh, technology or whatever. So um, looking at those. Um, next one is comparing students in, in terms of the kinds of metaphor they use. So this is a more qualitative study of how students represent, especially social media in those essays. So what kind of metaphors do they use in Arabic and what do they use in English for talking about social media? And a big question, not only in our context, but also in other contexts, is to what extent is English a second language for these students? So some of them went to English medium high schools, some of them went to English medium kindergartens. Um, so, uh, you know, what's the kind of relation of dominance or proficiency between their languages? Um, and I will put this slide up showing future developments, but um, it's best if I, if I wind up now and just see if there are any questions. <laughs>